Yeah, so these are the solution for yesterday's exercises. Uh, and the one thing I wanted to uh, go back onto is uh, for exercise three, and this is this is sort of what I uh, I ended up with yesterday before we we finished. Um, uh, so this is this is so this is the third exercise. This is about tri running trinomatic, um, and I'm going to give you the the output files for for trinomatic, so you don't have to care about about whether you actually finished or not. But I wanted to come back on a couple of things regarding the solution. Is so this is the command line that uh, we ended up with. And so which, which uh, I mean, you were supposed to run and I mean, we showed that yesterday. One thing I wanted to mention is, uh, first of all, you can break, I mean, this is a very long command line. It's very hard to edit. And it's very hard to also check that you're not making any mistakes just because it's so inconvenient. So the first thing you can do is actually break up the command into several parts onto several into several lines using like a, a backslash at the end of the line, which means when you have a backslash as a last character of the line. Um, the meaning is ignore the new line that just follows it. So, uh, so you have a backslash and then you press enter to get to the new line and that enter is going to be ignored. Uh, so the, the command line actually just keeps going onto several lines like this. Uh, so that's one option we can we can do to kind of make the command more readable and, and easier to edit and like reduce the chance that we're making an error in our command, just to keep things more tractable. Uh, the other thing is, so we mentioned about uh, the issues that could arise when we're trying to check, change our change our command line to process a, a different sample. And especially the fact that um, there are really two places where we need to change the sample name whenever we do this. And if we mix up, then we expose ourselves to issues down uh, further down the pipeline. And maybe we're just going to have to redo. I mean, in the base case, we're just going to re have to redo everything. Um, so in general, we want to be really careful. And one way we can, one approach we can have to avoid having this problem entirely is just having the sample name in a single place and then using it everywhere a sample name is needed. And for this, we're just using a shell variable. Uh, and so instead of, of one single command, we're just going to have two commands. And the first command is going to be to define the variable. Uh, so we're creating a variable with the name sample and inside that variable, we're storing this uh, sample name. And then we can just, uh, so this is the same command as above, and we can just reuse that variable wherever we need uh, the sample name. So instead of um, just repeating p10k over rep one, we can just repeat sample and in both places. And then the good thing now is if we change the value of the sample variable, that is going to be changed in, in both places where it needs to be changed. Uh, and we don't have the risk of not changing it everywhere. Uh, the second thing is building on this ID, we can actually now, because we can change the sample name so easily, this actually sets up some command to be included in the for loop. So, uh, so here we just have two samples. We could just like take our first sample, run the command with, with the first sample. Uh, and then change the name of the sample run the command a second time. Uh, but if we're going to have many samples, like to say we're going to have 30 samples and then, and then 30, we, we certainly don't want to do that 30 times. Um, and clearly computers are amazingly more able to do this sort of repetitive task than we are. And the solution is actually, so it's a for loop. Um, are you, uh, just to have an idea, how many of you are familiar with, with for loops? And so, are you, so most of you are not familiar. Okay, so it's just to give you a small example and, and, and the full loops, you're just going to have to, to wrangle with them as you're doing uh, your, your own analyzes. Uh, and it's not the focus of the class, but I just wanted to give you the example and then trying to give you the, the ID uh, behind full loops is essentially here, we're creating this, uh, this construct here, the four several different values of, of the sem for different values within the, the sample variable run the same code. Uh, and that's going to do something different because just this, the value inside sample is different. And so it's for uh, a variable in 
uh, a range of values, then do all of the, they do this command, and then uh, that's just marking the end of the for loop. Uh, and what this is going to do is it's going to do the same thing as above, uh, and it's first going to take the p10k or rep1 value and put it into the sample variable. And then it's going to run that command, which is the same as above. And then it's going to arrive here. And instead of just like keep, I mean, going to the next command, it's going to go back to the beginning. And then it's going to use the p10 rep1 value and put it in the sample command. And again, run this command um, uh, with a new value for the, in the variable. And so it's going to just run the command for the first sample, then for the second sample. And then when it runs out of sample to process, it's just going to stop and keep going. Uh, to, so, so like stop looping and then uh, going to the rest of the code. Okay, so that's just to show you the, the way you would normally set it up to process not just one sample or, or, or uh, but all of your samples without having to do it by, by hand. Um, okay, so this is in the, in the Google Drive. Uh, so this was just like to come back um, on yesterday's exercises very briefly. Uh, and so today what we're talking, going to talk about is uh, going to be um, alignments and, and genomes. Um, where's my, um, oh, there it is. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so the idea is, is again, this is our, our overall RNA-seq analysis pipeline for, for the bioinformatics. And so we start with uh, our raw reads. And yesterday we've, we've seen how we could just check the quality of these reads. Um, and then we've also seen how we could filter the reads for, I mean, filter out the reads that had bad qualities, uh, just remove some noise from the data set. Uh, and so now what we're going to, to look, uh, look at today is how we can align these reads to a reference genome. And really the idea behind uh, this alignment is that we're, we're like looking for this. So we're starting with, with raw reads, which are just like sequences of 100 base pair each. And then we're getting, what we want is, is to arrive with this idea that we just want to count how many reads map to each gene. This is going to be our measure of, of how expressed this or that gene is. Uh, and so uh, so this would be one gene and then we have um, um, reads mapping to the different exons and then we can tally all of this. And then we end up with, uh, if this is gene one, for instance, we end up with a, a count value for uh, how many reads map to that gene. Uh, yes, so essentially we're just like looking at what we need here is, is really to know which reads go into which gene, right? And what we start with is just this 100 base pair sequence. And so this is just another view of, of the same thing is, um, this is with uh, the IGV um, genome browser, which we're going to use uh, later today. Uh, and essentially each of these boxes here are uh, this the small arrows here. I'm, I'm not sure how clearly you can you can see. I uh, actually have a a window uh, open for uh, truth. So this is the same thing. This is this is actually uh, the IGV genome browser, um, which is is currently running. And so I can move around and I can I can zoom in on on um, on on specific region. And this is this is like the gene, like this, this is a specific gene. I'm not sure what gene this is. This is PDE6C. And so each of these arrows here um, is one read. So this one, for instance, starting here and until there is, is one read. And so we, if I just hoover over the read, I get some, some information. Um, uh, so this is cell so again. This is uh, this is not 100 base pairs. This is uh, 76 base pair in this case. But generally, we're going to look at something that's like uh, 50 base pairs or 100 base pairs long. Uh, and so yeah, this reach just aligns to the genome in this and this specific area. I can zoom out just to show you. So here on the bottom we have our our gene. So it just didn't show the alignments when I'm zoomed out too much. And this is chromosome 19. Um, at uh, megabase 38, uh, and then um, 
yeah, I can just, uh, essentially these are what we're going to end up with today is just these mappings of reads um, onto, um, onto the genome, like where each read is going in the genome. So which gene is each read corresponding to? And then we can tally this and get our uh, expression values. Uh, the other thing I can mention is, is really that uh, you're going to see, you see that some reads here. So if I if I zoom in a little bit more, so uh, these areas here with like these gray boxes there, where uh, so these gray histograms they're actually coverage is just like the number of reads that that cover this specific base pair in the genome, uh, and so we have a lot of coverage here and a lot of coverage there, um, and in the middle there's no coverage and and the reads have this like blue lines connecting them. And this is actually uh, when the reads, so the reads are coming from messenger RNAs and those messenger RNAs have been spliced. So all the exons have been put together. Um, and uh, the, back, the backbone here we're looking at is actually the, the genome sequence. So the genome sequence has the introns, the reads don't have the introns. Uh, so sometimes the reads just, uh, whenever a read uh, overlaps two exons, then uh, it's just going to jump from one place to another in the genome. And this is what these like the blue lines here mean is like this is a bit of a, this is a bit of a read, and then that read actually starts uh, over here. So that that read starts in this exon in this exon, and then uh, for most of for most of the read is just the exon, and then uh, it finishes in the in the next exon. Uh, and so that's going to be uh, the main thing we're going to have to deal with in terms of the, the genome alignment with rna data is this idea that our reads come from spliced uh, RNAs. Uh, and so we have to account for uh, these splicing events that they're not going to align to the genome directly, but can also uh, have this um, extra uh, feature. Uh, and so this is just to like to to kind of replace this in a in a broader context is that essentially um, when we sequence our when we get the sequences the the RNA fragments they're they're completely mixed mixed up right we when we prepare I mean first of all the the RNA transcripts there um, there's independent separate molecules and they're just freely floating in the cell. And then we're doing all the library preparation and um, and none of this is is trying to separate the genes, the, I mean, trying to separate what what's coming from where in the genome. And then uh, PCR, I mean, uh, yeah, so uh, the sequencing itself is also just not introducing any sort of um, classification of the reads based on where they come in the genome. So the, the order in which we get the reads is, is absolutely random. And the big question is going to be where in the genome do these reads come from, right? I get a read uh, and then I, I have no idea in the beginning for these, these 75 base pairs or this, this 100 base pairs, I have no idea which chromosome it, it should be, it's, it's coming from. And the idea is just like by looking at the sequence, we're going to just find where in the genome it comes from uh, and we have to account for, for splicing doing this. Uh, and so for this, we're going to need two things. I mean, um, so we're going to need, uh, I mean, essentially we, we need two things. We need the, the reference genome and we need the, the read. Uh, and so the first thing I wanted to, to talk about was really what is a reference genome? Uh, and so for instance, I'm going to take uh, the, mouse, the mouse genome. Um, and so when you can, I mean, there are a number of, of places where you can browse genomes and you can even browse genome in your own computer as we're going to do um, uh, later today. Uh, but just to show you, uh, we, can, we can go to the Ensemble website, um, so which is a genome database, and we can uh, look at the mouse genome. And if we do this, um, we're going to arrive on this page, I can, I can show you. So I'm on the on some. This is this is my my web browser, 
and then um, I'm on Ensemble, and then I, I can click on the mouse genome. Um, and then this is going to take me on this page. And really, the two things that are important here are one, uh, the genome assembly. So this is back to PowerPoint. Uh, the genome assembly and the gene annotations that come with it. Uh, and really, the, the fundamental idea here when we're talking about reference genomes is that we have, we need at least two things. And, and one is the sequence itself. So just the, the sequence of A's and T's and, uh, and, and the sequence of bases. And that just and that can be a specific length. It's just the, the, the sequence of the genome itself, really. Um, but that doesn't have much information. I, I, I mentioned yesterday, you can't really do much with just a genome uh, if you just have a genome sequence. So really, when we talk about the reference genome, we're talking about the sequence, but we're also talking about all the annotations that come with it. So where are the genes? And then where are this or that features? Where are the, which, where are the sequences that, uh, that correspond to protein and that don't correspond to protein? Where are the sequences where uh, transcription factors are abiding? Where are the, are the sequences that change depending on this or that condition? So we, we have like all these annotations that give a meaning to the genome itself. Uh, and the core, annotation we want is, is actually where are the, the genes or where are the, what places injured genomes are, are getting transcribed. So really we have these two uh, elements to a, a genome. One is just the genome and the second one is, is a gene annotation. And so Ensemble uh, lets us, we can just go, like, go to Ensemble and we can uh, click about, uh, on more information and statistics. And that kind of will tell us more about about the genome itself. So um, this is about the, the assembly itself. So this is just like specific number of bases, like which is just how many bases you have you actually have in the genome file, uh, where it comes from, and, and everything. Uh, yeah. And so the the other one is um, the the gene annotation. Um, and this is uh, actually the same page, but um, this other box refers to, to the genes, um, to this other source of information um, where we have 22,000 genes and, and like, uh, different, different informations on um, our genome. Um, and so the other thing we can, we can do is once we have like the, the, gene, the, the, the genome and the gene is, is then we can just let the users query this information interactively. So this is what these online genome browsers let you do. Uh, so for instance, we can just look, look up for that gene, PDE6C, um, and that's going to take us to uh, this sort of page where um, we have a gene card. It gives us all the information that exists in the genome database uh, for ensemble regarding that gene. So there's the, the gene, gene ID, there's an ensemble specific ID, there's a name. Um, there's of course where the, the gene is in the genome, like the specific bases that the gene covers, um, potentially different transcripts. And in this case, this gene has two transcripts, uh, two separate transcripts. Uh, and then other information, there's, there's here a link to uh, a separate database, which is the, the Uniprot database, which is a protein database. And that has more functional information. Uh, so this gives us the sort of information for, uh, for that gene, right? It gives us like what the gene is supposed to be doing, um, information about the catalytic activity and these sort of things. Um, yes, and, and the last thing we can, we can do is just go to region in detail. And that would take us to chromosome 19, uh, 38 uh, megabases, and then we can just like see the gene. Um, in the browser. Uh, two things I, I can insist on, uh, I can mention regarding this, uh, um, this database is uh, one, uh, one thing ensemble, I mean, the, the reason, the main reason maybe why I'm showing ensemble rather than different one is 
is actually because Ensemble has a very good handling of, of gene IDs and especially gene IDs over time, like what happens when a gene annotation is changed. Like let's say that um, people realize, like researcher realized after doing experiments that maybe a gene has one more alternative transcript or maybe there is an alternative transcript that actually is thought to be artifactual or maybe just the gene itself is thought to be artifactual if it's not a very well annotated gene. It might just like these, are, I mean, be decided that the gene was not uh, an actual gene, uh, was an actual functional gene. Um, and so Ensemble provides like the, the Biomart, which is a resource to deal with uh, gene IDs and just general feature IDs for, for genome annotations. And it's just like, lets you convert IDs to to anything really, like like IDs from other databases are inter interfaced with Ensemble IDs, and then you can um, um, yeah convert like to track IDs over time through like through like the years, like what happened to my IDs that were published ten years ago, and you can just use the bottom to um, manipulate I, I mean IDs and like essentially manipulate the changes in the genome annotation. Uh, and this other thing I want to mention is, uh, so uh, Ensemble actually is the same group of people that provide the gen code annotation. So these are the gene annotations for uh, human and mice. Uh, so it, those two specific reference genome, they're maintained by this, this gen code group uh, where they have like people curating the annotations more, more specifically. And the, the annotations present in Ensemble and in GenCode are, are going to be the same. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, just two things to mention uh, additionally. So yeah, and really, so uh, coming back to this, this core ID that when we're talking about reference genome, we're talking about two core elements, uh, the, the sequence itself and the gene position. Um, so another thing we can do is with Ensemble is actually just download these two elements to use um, uh, ourselves. Um, and so one is going to be the, the genome sequence. And the second one is going to be the uh, gene annotations. So the, here's a, just the DNA sequence. And the second part is gene annotations. And this is going to be a GTF file. I'm going to uh, uh, come to this in a second. Uh, and so if we click on those links that I just showed uh, previously, we arrived on Ensemble FTP, uh, where we have all these uh, sequences, different sequences we can download. And we can download like the individual sequences for each of the chromosomes. Uh, I'm still a bit confused why they have all this separately, but there is really one that we, we want to use. This is one called DNA, soft masked, and then primary assembly. This is just, something uh, you have to know. This is generally the one you want. Um, and so we can we can click on this, we can download that. And this is going to be a fast A file. The FA here stands for fast A. Uh, and so um, same thing, we can do the same for the gene annotation. So we can click on the link from the, the page, the, the web page earlier. And this is going to take us to a different place in the FTP. Uh, and again, we can download the, the GTF annotations. Um, and so these two files, what do they look like? So the, the first one is a FASTA file. And that's, again, that's the, the simpler one. That's just literally giving you the, the sequence of the chromosomes. Uh, and it looks something like this. Um, uh, this would be the, the top of the file. And it starts with this greater than sign. Uh, and that just gives you the, the header line for a specific sequence or a specific chromosome. Um, and so in this case, it's chromosome one. There's some annotations about some information about chromosome one, where like exactly what the chromosome and what the version is for the genome. Uh, and then there's a, the chromosome sequence itself, right? And it just like keeps going like this for, for millions and millions of bases. And then we have chromosome 10, for instance, uh, and then chromosome 11. And, and so we get all the, all the mouse chromosomes in this, this one file. Um, so that for for uh, the the genome reference, really, uh, they all of this all of the sequencing effort and all of the assembly effort eventually comes into this this one file. Um, 
that is just literally the, the genome sequence itself. Uh, but again, so very simple in, in, in practice, but very difficult to work with because it's very difficult to extract any meaning from, from those raw sequences. And so the second type of file that uh, composed a genome annotation is, is the, uh, the annotations file. So it's going to be either a GTF file or a GFF file. And they're, they're really the same format. Uh, uh, so GTF stands for GFF2, which is uh, uh, the genomic feature format. Um, and then we have, so we have, uh, I mean, originally there was GFF, the first one, and then there's been GFF2 and there's been GFF 2.5 and uh, there's GFF 3. But the, the main two format that are still existing is, and, and for some reason they've not been merged together, um, but it's just on GTF and GFF 3 and they're very similar um, uh, with some, some differences that relate to how bioinformatic programs can uh, parse them. Uh, but they both look like this. Uh, they're uh, TSV files, so they're tab delimited plain text files. Uh, and then they have like a bunch of, of columns like this. And the first one is uh, the, I mean, the, the basic column is for, and each line corresponds to one feature. Uh, and a feature can be one of different things, can be a gene, can be a transcript, can be an exon, can be a part of a CDS. Uh, it can be smaller things like a five prime. Uh, it can be a, a stop codon or start codon. And then it can be other types of feature like um, five prime UTR. It could be a transcription factor binding site. It could be a, a TATA box. It could be anything really. Um, and then the second thing is is there is this chromosome column here and the start and end columns that tell us exactly where this feature is in the genome. Uh, and then we have a strand column that also tells us which direction, for instance, a gene is going to be in. And then we have some metadata, which is where the two files differ and exactly how they write it. Um, so we can have gene IDs, gene names, uh, uh, any sort of, of additional information about that particular feature that is being documented on that line. Um, yeah, so it's just a TSV file with essentially a region in the genome, which is going to be comprised of a chromosome, a beginning, an end, and maybe a, a strand if that feature is strand specific. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just what feature is it and what type of feature it is, and then further information about the feature itself. Uh, so this is really what, what annotations uh, annotation are. And so uh, just to come back to uh, exactly, uh, so what I had showed you before, uh, so this is my, my IGV genome browser again. Uh, and so if I, if I zoom out, I can see that I have my, my gene here in the bottom. Um, so this is my PDE6C gene and it is annotated here as, as like go, coming, starting here and then has a few exons and then stops there. And, and this is really what the GTF file represents is, is like, this, this TSV file I just showed you um, just lists like um, these different elements. Like we have a gene that starts somewhere. So that starts like at, I mean, around megabase 38 and then has a number of exons and um, write all of this. And this is where that gene has two different transcripts. Um, okay, so that is, uh, that is it for, for reference genomes. Um, and I'm going to switch to aligners. Do you have any questions on, on reference genomes? Um, I do have a question about that. So for example, in an experiment where, um, let's say in a cancer study, you have, you inject human cancer cells to the mouse and then you take the tumor and do RNA sequencing, what do you do use as a reference genome? Human? So you would use mouse. in this case, the, the human genome. Um, so, I, I, this, uh, so I've not done this, this approach specifically. So, so what you expect is 
the two more the uh, the two more cells, they're going to have human uh, RNA. So that that RNA is going to map to to mice, to not to mice, to that's that, that RNA is going to map to the human genome, um, because it's coming from the human genome originally. Um, but then you may want to. There may be some some application specific tools to filter out things that map better to the mouse genome than to the human genome. You could actually use uh, both genomes at the same time, but just take all the chromosomes from both of them and the human stuff is going to map to the human genome and the mouse stuff is going to map to the mouse genome. Uh, uh, you would have to look up the what what people normally do for for this approach. Uh, it's pretty not a big issue because mice and, and humans are quite different in terms of their their sequences. Okay, so basically, an approach would be to match to to align with both and then kind of like filter out what is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So really, I I what what. Uh, so we're going to we're going to do an exercise on, on creating like how you actually create a genome database. But if I if I just uh, show you, um, go back to what I've already shown. This is this is a genome. So you could create like a genome that has all of the human chromosomes and all of the mouse chromosomes. Uh, and because the mouse transcripts are going to match much more closely the mouse genome, they're going to align to the mouse genes, and the human transcripts are going to align to the human genes. Um, and so you're not going to, and then you can just filter out everything that maps to the, the mouse genome. And you're also going to have a quantification of how much maps to the mouse genomes. And it, really what this would involve in practice would be to take this, this genome sequence file and, and concatenate the two genomes. And you would have this genome with all of the human and all of the mouse chromosomes. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, um, so once you have the genome and then we have, so we have, we, so now we, I hope you get a, a good idea of uh, what a genome is. So we have the sequence and then we have some information about where the exons are, so, and where the, the introns are. So relating to this problem I mentioned earlier about how we have to account for exons when we align RNA-seq data to the genome uh, because they're just going to skip over introns. Uh, and so aligners um, are bioinformatic tools that let us do this. So they're, they're just like bioinformatic programs that have been uh, published by, by others. And there's been a lot of work trying to tackle this problem, which is um, a very uh, like important part of the like genome analysis pipeline. And at the same time, it's a very difficult problem from a computational perspective and it's taking a lot of time. Uh, and it's in, in many, many protocols, it's actually the longest step um, in terms of the most computationally intensive step. Um, and just to mention a few of them, uh, uh, the one we're going to use is star aligner. It is uh, maybe, I mean, it's very commonly used. It's like for instance, recommended by GATK. Uh, the main drawback of this of this one is it's quite fast. The main drawback is that it has very large memory requirements. And uh, what this means in, in practice is during the workshop, we're just going to use um, chromosomes 18 and 19 from the mouse genome instead of using the entire genome, which would uh, for which we would need um, much more memory that we are going to be able to get. Uh, we're just going to use chromosome 18 and 19. So that's the main rollback. Um, another that's very well known is top hat. Um, uh, mostly, uh, I mean, it works well, but it's been uh, superseded by, by this, this th third one, uh, high sat two, uh, which is from the same authors. And in terms of its, comp uh, it's like, time and computational performance, it's faster than STAR and it's, uh, uh, it's not using as much memory. So it's easier to run, but uh, it possibly have a, it's, it's possibly a bit less robust than STAR. So I think it's, a, it's another really uh, commonly used one. 
uh, and it's a good one, uh, but here we're just going to use star. Uh, and then you can find reviews online um, that, where you, you can find like all of the different approaches that, that have been, been published for this, for this problem. Uh, one thing I would like to mention though is, is usually if your data is, is relatively clean, if your problem is relatively simple, you're not going to see a huge difference depending on what exact solution you use for, for your problem. Um, if your data is clean, then this is usually not going to make a difference. Uh, and the, the main reason why I would, I would, um, I want to mention this and insist on this is this, this step is really the, the most computationally intensive um, out of the entire pipeline. So, which means that it's going to be taking a lot of time. It's going to be taking a lot of organization resources to um, just have the step to complete. Um, but then it's actually not the most critical step in terms of the parameter. So meaning if, it, if it's worked with star, generally you can uh, just rely uh, right away on, on the results you get the, the first time once it's run successfully. Um, and so instead, most of the variation you may see from one experiment to another, or, or you may see in like the, the different sources of variation in your experiment is going to be the quality of the input libraries. So just like uh, how good the RNA was. Uh, and then there are a number of other steps that can introduce a lot more noise in the counts. And so this is from this, uh, from this review of, of different software, from this benchmark of different softwares. Um, and so they had like a number of different statistics, which I'm not going to uh, all describe. Uh, and uh, what we can see is um, that here they use, so uh, any of three aligners, so top hat, star, and high sat two, which are the one I mentioned. And then they use it with two different software to count, actually estimates the number of, um, of read counts. Uh, and most of the difference actually comes from using cufflinks versus string tie. And there is almost no difference between um, using any of the three alignment softwares. Uh, so for instance here, um, and so the, the, the way we actually count, quant how we actually quantify the expression from some given read alignments matter more than uh, than the actual aligner. So generally, so the aligner, the alignment step is 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 intimidating in terms of of actually running it, but it is not the the most critical step in terms of parameter choice. Um, so alignments themselves, they're they're quite reliable. Uh, the one thing you want to to account for is is the type of data you have. Of course, if you have long reads. Then you can't use the same the same methods. Uh, if if you have very short reads like um, like re small regulatory RNAs, that would be a, a different method. So this is for this is for messenger RNAs sequenced with Illumina that that we can really use any of these three uh, methods. Um, so when you have a very different type of read then you want to use a different bioinformatic method is, is essentially this. But as long as you have Illumina reads then, um, or Illumina reads that are anywhere from uh, 50 base pair to, um, to 250 base pair, the same, the same learners are going to, to, be, to, be, uh, to be good options. Uh, and so finally, the, the last thing I want to mention today is, is uh, these uh, alignment files. So we, we uh, talked about the genome assembly files. We talked about uh, the genome annotations files. Um, and so the third format we're going to deal with today is the, the BAM SAM format, which is the, the format that describes the alignment. So if I just um, go back to my uh, IGV window and, and maybe I can just zoom back on um, 
some of these reads, right? So I have I have these reads here aligned to the genome, um, and that third format, that's that SAM BAM format, so which are equivalents. I'm going to come back to it in a moment. So the BAM format is just describing this read goes there, and then it aligns maybe with a gap in the middle because of the intron. So this is really the information that's going to be in our BAM file. Um, and so, yeah, so these are BAM files. Um, uh, BAM file tends, I mean, stands for binary SAM, and then SAM stands for sequence alignment map. Um, and really they're, they're just like these sequence alignments. Um, so they're files that contain aligned, sequence, aligned reads. They're the standard format. This is, everybody's using this specific format for Illumina alignments. Uh, there is this the SAM tools program that we can manipulate the the files with. Like this this file, the specific format you can't manipulate it with. Um, you can't really manipulate it with basic uh, Unix tools. You you really need some bioinformatic tools to help you with changing the files. And then the general structure of the form of the of the file is is a header section, which is going to contain uh, information about the genome, like how long the the chromosomes are. And then it's going to contain maybe some uh, some commands that were used to create the file. So just for uh, tractability of the of the of the experiment of the bioinformatic analysis. And then uh, the actual information is going to be contained in the alignments uh, section, which is going to be most of the file. Um, and this is going to uh, look something like this. So. Uh, if I just go to the next slide, uh, so this is the same, uh, the same file as before, and this is this is SAM. So, but but the the binary format essentially contains the same information. Um, and again, this is a TSV file, so a, a tab delimited table. Um, and so we have here we have the read name, um, and then we have the sequence and the bias quality for the base qualities for that sequence. So this is the read name, the sequence, and the bias qualities. Uh, those are the same as, as what we had in the FASTQ file. So we're going to arrive with a FASTQ file, and then which comprises reads, and then we're going to align that th those reads to the genome. And in the output file, or the output BAM file, we're going to find, again, the same um, information that we already had in the FASTQ file. So the read name, sequence, and bias qualities. And in addition, we're going to have this other um, elements, uh, all the information, which are the, the chromosome, where the, uh, the alignment starts, and then exactly how the alignment is. Um, is I mean, the details of the alignment, how the read aligns to the genome exactly. Uh, and so this is from the, the SAM specification. This is just like listing each column and what it does. Uh, the one column I haven't mentioned yet is the flag column and that gives like additional information on on the alignment and and how the alignment was uh, so these are annotations for the alignment uh, so annotations in the sense of uh, specific modifiers in in how we should understand this alignment should be should be read i'm going to come back to this in a second um uh, the one thing i kind of want to mention is uh, the cigar uh, strings. Uh, so and uh, here, if I just like again, um, so I have this one read with a specific sequence, and the aligner, the main information the aligner has created is taking the the sequence and mapping the sequence back to the place in your gen genome where this sequence uh, matches. And this sequence might not map exactly to the genome. Uh, I mean, without any differences, but um, uh, essentially, the liner is able still to tell us that this goes to a specific chromosome. So in this case, it's, it's, uh, this is a stickleback data, by the way. This is why the chromosomes are written a bit uh, differently. Uh, and then where exactly, uh, which base in the genome that sequence aligns. And then the cigar string is how that sequence aligns. Uh, and so these are just two examples of the cigar strings, like 100 matches. 
Um, and again, this is this table here is from the description of the description of the the SAM format. Um, and uh, M, the M letter stands for for uh, match, meaning there is the the read and the sequence just are face to face without any uh, offsets. Um, and then we have these these other uh, some op uh, cigar operations, um, which can be essentially indel. So either insertion, deletions. These would be the main ones for um, RNA reads. Especially we're going to see these ends as well, which are introns. Uh, and essentially, this is what the uh, the cigar strings. This is how cigar strings are read. So this would be for this one cigar string here. Uh, 63M, 3I, 34M. And that means we have 63 nucleotide that match the genome directly. And th th we might have like base differences here, but there, there's no in doubt. And so this is what the alignment match means. And then we have this, this three base pair insertion. Uh, so which is here, and then we have to introduce, uh, kind of visualize a gap in the, in the reference and then another 34 nucleotides that map the, the genome directly. So this is what the, the, the cigar string means, is that essentially lets us know that there is, in this alignment, there is uh, an indel. Uh, and this is how the, the, the BAM format records the information about, about the alignment. Um, and so the last thing about uh, the, the BAM format is, is a, a field that's quite important when you're trying to do statistics on your uh, alignments, and that's the, the flags field. And the flag field is, is a bit weird. Um, it was created, um, it, it was, so these files, they were created in the, in the beginning of, um, of bioinformatics of, of like large scale genomics. Uh, and they're really corresponding to uh, binary uh, objects. So the, the flags really refer to, okay, I have one byte and then I have, uh, so one byte is going to have eight bits. And then these bits can be either uh, up or down. So zeros or, or ones. And each flag is going to consider to each bit. So each bit or each flag is going to correspond to a specific property the alignment has. Um, and so uh, maybe the, the three most important flags are for a specific record, so for a specific line of our SAM file, we're going to have information about whether the read that is on this line is unmapped or whether the read on this line is an alignment that's additional to, a, to the major alignment or that's um, yet another uh, type of um, of alignment uh, that is not the primary alignment. And so the, the primary alignments somehow in, in the sign format is defined as alignments that, are, that have none of these three flags. They're not flagged as just primary alignments, they're flags as neither unmapped nor secondary nor supplementary. So a normal alignment is going to have, uh, is not going to have any of these three flags. And then we have other flags like uh, whether the sequence map to the read maps to the to the negative strand of the genome, um, whether the read is paired, whether the the aligner has found the two reads of a pair in the same area of the genome. Uh, and so what we're going to see with sand flags is really that uh, so this is this is quite understandable when it's binary format, but the sand format lists this as base ten. So for instance, the SAM format is just going to tell us 163. Uh, and this is, this is not meaningful. This is just an addition of numbers from, from this column here. Um, and, um, oh, one second, sorry. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, 
going to be just one number like this. It doesn't directly make sense. And what makes sense would be to convert it back to binary format. And then we can see which of these flags are actually, uh, actually there. And so this is what the SAM tools flags command does is we can, we can give it a, num uh, a number and then it's going to be paired, proper pair. Um, and then this is, would be the, the second read of a pair. Uh, for instance, this would be for, for, one, for one read. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so I briefly mentioned the SAM tools program. This is really the one program that we're going to use for most of the BAM file operations. Um, uh, so BAM file, they're, they're binary files, so we really can't do much with them. Uh, so the, the main SAM tools sub program is going to be view, which just converts uh, that these binary BAM file into text files, which are these SAM files. Uh, and I mean, we have different options which are listed. Um, one important aspect of BAM files is that they can be sorted or unsorted. Uh, a sorted BAM file is going to be a BAM file that where all the reads have been ordered so that all the reads that map to the same region of the genome are in the same area, I mean, in the same part of the file. So uh, in particular, um, so we have, um, we have, so we have uh, a number of chromosomes in the genome. And uh, in the, if we look at the genome sequence, we're going to start with chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three. But when we have a FASTQ file, and we're just feeding a FASTQ file and a, a list of reads to a genome align, aligner. It's going to align the first read and then it's going to align the second read. And those reads are just going to map to random places in the genome. And uh, so we can write the BAM file like this where we just write the BAM file in the same order as the, the input FASTQ file. Um, but any region in the BAM file is not correspond to any particular region of the genome. So instead, what we can do is sorting our alignments so that all of the alignments for chromosome one are in the beginning of the file, and then all the alignments for the chromosome uh, 22, for instance, are at the end of the file. Uh, and then within chromosome, we can sort uh, the, the alignments so that the alignments that map to the beginning of the chromosome are all at the beginning of the file, and all the alignments that map at the the end of the chromosome are at the end of the file. Okay. And so a lot of programs need the data to be, to be sorted. Uh, index is, is one we're going to, uh, to use. It's just when we have a sorted file, so we have, so that the sorted alignment file is, is going to have all the alignments for chromosome one at the beginning and then all of the alignments for chromosome two and then all the alignments for the rest of the chromosomes. Uh, and what we can do is, is create an index that, com that contains information about where chromosome one starts, where chromosome two starts, where chromosome three starts, et cetera. Uh, so this is what the index, uh, index does. And we can do the same thing for, uh, actually this one is for FASTA files, but it's, it's the same idea as for, for the index command, but for FASTA files. Uh, the flags command, I mentioned it, and then flags are just creating some simple statistics on, on a BAM file. Okay? Uh, and so, the last thing I wanted to, to mention is once we've done these alignments, uh, we still want, I mean, there's going to be a question on how good our alignments are. Um, and again, in general, it's going to be very uh, black or white. Um, and for most, in most cases, you're just going to find that these alignments, they're, they're just properly mapping to the genome, I mean, your, your data set is properly mapping to the genome. And for human and mice, typically that means that about 75 to 90% uh, of reads are going to align to the genome and um, in a unique fashion. Um, the main thing we should be, um, and there isn't really a way to, to, to quantify easily or, or to, easily check the quality of, of read alignments. Um, but typically for, for a successful experiment, we expect around 80% of reads aligning. Uh, there are some quality control tools 
uh, but it is a lot of uh, a lot, I mean, it is a lot of additional work, and the the results are often not very clear cut. Uh, so it's not necessarily useful to unless there is like a big issue with the data set. It's not necessarily useful to really dig into quality check at the at the alignment level. The one thing we really want to do is make sure that we don't have uh, that we have similar outcomes across samples. Uh, so if there is one sample that has quality issues, then usually it's going to be very different from the others. Uh, and in contrast, if all samples, um, if the experiment was successful on all samples, then uh, all samples should have more or less the same, the same mapping rates and, and general outcomes. Um, yeah, we can also look for for paired end. Um, so it, it, for paired end sequencing experiments, we expect both reads to map to the same area of the genome. So we have a bit more information there. Um, okay, any questions on um, on these alignments? Uh, hey, Nicholas, thanks. Um, if you could, would you mind going back to the the SAM file. I think it was the SAM file. The one that had the read name at the beginning and then sequence and quality score um, at the end. Uh, read name. Oh, yes. Um, this one. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the sequences on the end there, are those just for example, like very short? Or are so they they're very like short, a, for example, yes. Just the beginning of it, or will it, it, does the real version show the entire length of oh, the Oh, the real version shows the entire read, yeah. So the real okay. version just takes again the the FASTQ uh, sequence, the, the sequence that was presented in the FASTQ file. Um, and so these are going to be reads anywhere from, from 50 base pairs to um, 150 base pairs or 250 base pairs. But this, this doesn't contain the sequence of the reference. It just gives you the numerical information with that cigar score as to the, the exactly sort of quantitative uh, alignment. Exactly. So, okay. so the, the BAM file, so has this information that about the read, so it's just copies from the, which is just copied from the FASTQ files. But then, um, how that read matches the reference is really just about this, this cigar string. Thank you. And, and really the goal here is, is not to have you um, learn by heart what, what's in the, the SAM files or the BAM files, but just so that you, you really have an idea of how this, um, I mean, first of all, what information is there, and then how this relates to what we can see in a in a in a in an interactive browser like like a IGV, uh, and really what task the aligner is trying to accomplish. Um, Okay, so you're welcome to I mean, ask any questions as we're working on the exercises, but uh, if we don't have specific question right now, we're just going to uh, switch to exercises. So exercise four, um, and today we're uh, only going to work on exercise four. Oh, and I said I was going to give you
Okay, so this is uh, so this is on the cluster. And uh, if you need the trim the trim file, so the clean reads file, um, uh, they're in this uh, directory here, which is the directory you originally had copied, um, and it's still in the same state as what you originally copied. But in addition, if you cd to this directory, um, you're going to see this this trim and clean reads file, which you can use for um, exercise four. Thanks. And Nicholas, so, so when we when we uh, you know log into the actual compute nodes, what are what are some like reasonable limits? Um, I had put that that uh, you know eight gigabyte command in, but you mentioned that you know doing like against the whole genome. Uh, what's something reasonable we could put in if we're going to try to do an experiment like that? So for star, uh, so normally eight gigs is 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 reasonable in 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 general terms for for computing things on one processor is is something typical. So star it really has these big memory requirements. Um, so for to create a, a genome database, which is something you only need to do once um, on 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 a genome you've, I mean for a specific genome. Uh, that pre needs 64 mega, mega gigabytes, if not uh, up to 100. Um, and the, the main difference is, I mean, the cluster has these nodes that have this much memory. Um, the main difference is it's going to take you longer to get to get a, an interactive job with that much memory. And, and it's not possible for us to get one for, uh, for the workshop, like for every student. Uh, to actually align things, then you can use uh, maybe 32 gigs would, would work. And if it fails, I mean, very often on the cluster, that's that's part of the of the of the process of going through a data set is sometimes you're going to have things that fail. And then you can, if you see it fails because of the memory, uh, then you can just try something bigger. And the cluster is going to tell you how much memory you're process used. So if it if it finishes, or even if it doesn't finish, and then you see it, it's used everything it was killed by the by the cluster. Maybe this is a better question directly for the people that run Hoffman. But if if I'm in a lab, and I don't think we pay any extra specific amounts for like more resources. Um, if I'm just a general user of Hoffman, what what am I uh, allotted? Uh, so uh, in general, it should not be, in general, it should, it should not be an issue. Um, the main limit I think you're going to have is that you're not going to be able to do jobs that are more than one day, maybe uh, 24 yeah, hours. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. Uh, so that would be the main one. Um, if this is a problem, you should you should ask them. For for these things here, it should not be a problem. I mean, for for like 
the type of analysis we're discussing, even for full scale data sets, should not be a problem. The problem you are going to have is for storage. Uh, so your home directory for a full project is not going to be big enough. Uh, and so you have to buy storage space on the cluster. And that's, uh, I think that's $150 per terabyte per year. Thanks. Um, and and uh, generally speaking, like the the rule of thumb on the cluster is kind of ask for what you need, and and um, if the cluster give, I mean the cluster is is there to kind of organize who's getting what. So if the cluster give you something, then you shouldn't be worried of stepping on someone's toes. So it seems like this first part, like just making the star data, um, this isn't anything specific to our reads yet. It's This is just... No, it's just this, this your genome. Um, and so the, the main reason for this is is really that you can't align directly to the FASTA file in terms in, in the, like, it's just not efficient to start again with each read, try try the, to align the read. I mean, to, so you start with the, with the first read, right? The first read out of your 10 million reads. Um, and then you try to put it at the first base in the genome sequence, and then a second base in the genome sequence, and then that's third base of the genome sequence. And if you do that for, for every base in the genome and for every of your, each of your uh, 10 million reads, it's just not going to, uh, it's just not going to work. Um, that makes sense. I'm just wondering like if, if this is sort of a generic database of this uh, mouse genome assembly, why isn't it that there's sort of like just pre-made star database for a given assembly? Uh, it's just it's just that it would they would have to maintain like so many databases. Very often, like you're if you're in a lab where several people use like do alignments to the mouse genome uh, routinely with with everybody and everybody's using the same version of star. Um, then everybody would be probably using the same database because there is no oh, reason okay. to maintain several databases. Uh, to some extent, you can you can share the database, um, but then um, yeah, the database is going to depend on like Ensemble releases new versions with updates to um, human and mouse gene annotations every 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 year or even more often than this. Um, so it's just not feasible for Star to provide a database every single time for every single version of the human and, and mouse genomes and they all their, every other genome that, that can be out there. Um, it's just more but, simple <clears throat> to just let people do their, I mean, create their database. It's it's not a very big effort either to, to do it, so. Um, that makes sense. But so if, if for one given experiment, one given analysis, you really just have to do this up front. Once you've picked your reference genome, you do this up front and then it can stay stored as the star database for the remainder of your experiment. Yeah, it's really is just a rewrite of the of the of the genome. Got it. Oh. Uh, so it's it's yeah, it's just a, an image with with from a specific angle of those FASTA and, and GTA files. No. And very briefly, like the way these these images, uh, if if you like, work is, um, so as I mentioned, you can't you can't just take a read and try every position in the genome. Um, but one thing that is very efficient is say, like take the genome and then record for specific small sequences. Like you take a, a 20 or 25 base pair sequence and then you record where in the genome that sequence uh, exists. So it might be just 
one position or it might be a several. Uh, but regardless, you just take the sequence and record where in the genome it's, it, it could go, it could be. Uh, and that you can look up very, very quickly. Like you can arrive with any, and you can, you can do this for every 25 base pair sequence in the genome. Um, and if you've done this and you arrive with a 25, uh, with a read, you can just take the, the first 25 base pairs um, and ask where in the genome uh, could this be, could this read come from? Uh, and that's very fast. And so that's that's kind of the, the basic idea behind all the aligners. Uh, it's trying to do something in the like, trying to kind of reverse the problem in, in not having to try all the different positions in the genome, but instead of arriving with sequence and already having the information of where that sequence may go in the genome. Um, cool.
how long does the uh, mapping step take roughly in this example? I think you're muted. That that should take about 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, that said, it's it's. I mean, I've seen it take anything from less than 10 minutes to in the previous workshop. In some cases, it it uh, took even an hour. I can pre provide the the line the band files, the output band files. Uh, if you want to try to um, open them in in IGV. Let me just copy them. Yeah, I'm working on installing that browser right now. Okay, so I have uh, made the, the BAM, file avail BAM files available if you want to. Uh, um, if, if, you're, if your alignment steps are taking too long, um, then you can just use the BAM file in this directory here that's, that's showing um, in IGV. And I don't, I'm, I'm not really sure what causes alignments to sometimes be fast and sometimes be slow? Um, is there just a source of variance on the cluster that I, I can't pinpoint? Uh, it might be having, uh, so yeah, I'm not sure how long it's going to take today. In previous uh, workshop, it, it, uh, we were like a good, mem good number of people. So um, it might have to do with there's too many people trying the same thing at the same time. Um, although they're not that memory expensive jobs, it might have to do with the fact that we're working in the home directories rather than on the project directories, which should be in principle faster and more optimized for large files. Uh, I could try. Yeah, I've never been able to really pinpoint the problem. Why, why, why it finished fast for some people, why it finished slower for others. Uh, and also not all the computers in the clusters are, are identical.
Okay, any issues in creating the, the genome database or in uh, aligning the, the reads for the first sample? And again, uh, the, the alignments of the reads, uh, it's possible that it's just not going to complete for some of you. And in this case, you can just go to the directory I've pasted in the chat and you're going to find the BAM file there uh, so you can use them for, for IGV. Um, I'm having this weird issue where um, I made the index files with SAM tools of the two BAM files. And the, the software that I use to transfer programs back and forth is FileZilla. And I think you recommended a slightly different one, but I've used FileZilla for a long time. No, that should work. And it, yeah. it for some reason cannot see the index files. Like I'm definitely in the same directory there's something about the, I don't know if it's, if it's named too similarly to the BAM file, but it has a different no, extension. It, it's weird. I would, I would, uh, what you can try is, is trying to force the software to refresh the directory. Yeah, I, I've done that a couple. I actually oh, like log completely out. It's, it's the strangest thing because it's just a text file, but I'm, I'm uh, trying to rename it something else to see if it'll help. I don't think that's a name problem. It, it's either a, a, a refresh problem, but if you've tried to refresh the the directory, should not happen. Uh, but it could be a, a path problem. Uh, it is. It is very easy to just mess up paths, um, and having a small difference or something that looks similar but is not. Uh, and very often it's only when you solve the problem that you really understand what was going on. Uh, otherwise, you can use SCP. Oh, but you're you're using uh, you're using uh, yeah, uh, Putty, I, right? I actually, you, you're absolutely right. It was just in the adjacent folder, so my bad. It, it's very common. We've all done this millions millions of times. And, and the more experience you get, the faster you get to solve the issue is, is the main change.
Another thing, just to share uh, further mistakes that I'm making, so other people maybe don't, don't make the same mistake. That I've been trying to uh, in in the IGV browser, I I didn't change the organism to mouse, so I've been looking for this gene, and nothing's aligned to. On on this on this uh, topic, one thing I can mention is uh, so the MM10 mouse genome that we're using in IGV. Uh, this is actually the, the genome from the NCBI uh, genome database. Uh, and so for this, the assembly is going to be the same as for Ensemble. Um, but uh, the gene annotations are going to be slightly different. So they're not going to be the ENCODE annotations. Uh, not exactly, at least. They're, I mean, for the mouse and human genome, they're not very, very different. Um, uh, across databases, uh, but there's there are still differences. Like the genome annotations is something that's fairly sensitive, and there's like human choices there, and there's a number of things. It's not every gene that's always annotated the same. How do you annotate uh, the presence of multiple transcripts, for instance? Do you do you have the same threshold to consider that things exist, or do you just to recognize the existence of a specific transcript or a specific gene with, for which the evidence is not that great or, or any other feature. Um, so the reference genome is the same for everybody. Like when we're talking about the mouse genome where, and the, the a specific section of chromosome five, for instance, everybody has the same coordinates, um, but uh, the gene annotations specifically maybe uh, uh, so the gene annotations may be slightly different in their specifics. And so M MM10 is the, the RefSeq, the NCBI RefSeq version. My mapping just finished. So that took like 25 minutes, I guess. It is, it is very weird that the, the, like the, the time it actually takes is, is it shouldn't change in most cases. I mean, normally bioinformatic analyzes are very consistent in the runtime, but there's something when we do the workshop that's, and that might be, that might be the home directories. Uh, but it's very hard to, it's so far it's been very hard to pinpoint the problem.
Uh, Nicholas, so for, for the way that um, I just noticed, so for the the run that we just did, this alignment, that was on, because we only ran it, we only ran that for one of the samples, right? Not the other yes. one, because we set the sample variable to say the P10 knockout. So we right. we would have to go back and rerun this for the, the second sample to get both outputs. That's right. And this and is you, all for... <clears throat> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and, and uh, so it took 20 minutes for one sample. And so you'd have to do this for, I mean, for the other sample, or if you had the full data set for the other 29 sample. Um, and this is also only 5% of just of the reads of one sample. Um, so it would be not 20 minutes, but it would be a lot, lot longer than this. Uh, so this is why I kind of mentioned that it was a challenging step, but it is more challenging on the practical side and not so much on the on the the actual um, obtaining good alignments is is straightforward once you manage to just. Um, make the program run. Usually, if you make the program run, usually your alignments are good. And you're not going to see a very big difference compared to a different program. So is this the kind of thing where, like you mentioned earlier, that the using like a for loop and you know putting all your sample names in to run one after another, is that the kind of place where that would make sense? Yeah, this is typically the, the kind of place where this would make sense. Um, another option in this case, and that's that's kind of a cluster thing. It's 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 not really a, a, a general approach. Like the, the for loop is a general approach, um, but clusters also sort of have a way to emulate this this cluster this uh, this for loop approach, um, which is uh, RA jobs. And I'm going to say a, a bit more about that tomorrow, but it is something that's like kind of really on the limit of um, what you want to use. 
Uh, well, on the cluster, it's probably the most simple approach for processing many samples. Uh, it, there is a number of ways to do it. Uh, but the, the for loop is really when you're when you're thinking in terms of programming, it's it's really the, the for loop that comes to mind. Uh, and the RA jobs are just different ways of a different way of making for loops. Okay, and if you're if you're done, um, if you're done with the exercise four, um, we're just going to leave exercise five for tomorrow. Uh, has so um, if you're done, we can maybe look at the the IGV result if anyone's done. Um, but if that's the case, let let I mean we can look at the result and then um, uh, stop there for today. I'm happy to show mine. I made, I mean, I did it with the, the BAM files you provided. I didn't do it from. So do you have the two samples? Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's have a look at it. Can you see this? Yes. So I think if I'm interpreting this correctly, so I'm I'm in the mouth, I'm in the correct organism, and then right. I I found uh, this gene that we were talking about earlier just by searching in this box, and it looks like it loaded the non knockout sample up top, and then this is the knockout sample, um, and having never used this before, but just kind of looking at it, it looks like there's like way more reads from the knockout than there are from the other one. And I think you yeah. mentioned this is like the coverage at the top. Yeah, this is coverage. If you look in the in the on the left in the oh yeah, the panel, yeah left, this is coverage. And also the yeah. scale is different in both. Uh, yeah, I saw that. And you can so also like, just yeah. see that the reads are are, are there are just a couple of reads. In, in, in the top sample and uh, a lot more in the second sample. And really the reason is, and, and so this is really what we're looking for when we're, uh, the type of example we're looking for when you're doing, we're doing uh, differential gene expression. So in this study, the authors were looking for cone specific or rod specific genes for, for these like uh, photoreceptors. Um, and so that gene here is, is actually a cone specific uh, gene. Um, so the knockout sample, which, which doesn't have the transcription factor that creates the rods, um, is a cone and it also expresses a gene, but the, the rod sample does not. And so you can really just see, like even visually, that um, the gene is expressed in one sample, but not the other, or, or it's not much more expressed in one sample than the other. 
um, and then you can, yeah, and then you can see the um, the reads mapping and with the flight sites. Um, yeah, I mean, I, this is more, I guess, a biological question, but like all this stuff that I don't know, maybe looks like intronic areas. Do you usually just interpret that as like? contamination from genomic DNA, or is it more um, like uh, splicing? It, it's not always clear. I mean, I don't think it's very clear what this is. Um, sometimes you do see reads mapping in there. It could be spurious um, trans transcription. Uh, it could be um, just remains of RNA that's not being entirely spliced. Uh, it could be things that are actually multi-mapping, uh, that the mapping there for not good reasons. Um, as long as it's, and, and the coverage is much, much smaller than uh, for the rest. Uh, I feel like, I, I think it is yeah. in the same direction in this case, but sometimes you see it in, in a specific, in a other direction, which suggests that it's not uh, actually coming from the same transcript. Uh, but very often it's just mapping from repeated regions that may or may not be uh, reliable. Can I ask, what's the significance of each of these rows? Like why are some reads gathered uh, so, in... so if you if you zoom in on, on one, uh, like let's say on the two exons that are, yeah. So the, the blue lines actually connect things that are the same read. Uh, uh, so they're the but, splicing events within the reads. But oh, so then what puts two reads in the same row, like adjacent, if you go further down? But without a line? You yeah, mean, exactly. without a blue yeah, line. Without a, without a line. Is that just the software trying to uh, stack the reads. Like if it's if it's like all of it these put down reads, here. Yeah, so if it can, they put, don't have lines. Yeah, if it can put reads on the same, on the same like row, then it will. But then if it has too many reads and has to, I mean, then they would overlap. If it, if it, if they, if they were just put on the same row, then it just starts new rows. There's no meaning in, in two reads being on the same line, is what I mean. But it just stacks them toward the top. That so makes that sense. It's just saving overlap. space. Okay, thanks. Well, cool. Thank you, Nicholas. Yeah, so if we don't have any more uh, questions, I think we're just going to leave it there for today. I'm just going to be here until, until 4.30, but uh, uh yeah if you're done feel free to um feel free to like uh leave the class and then i'll see you tomorrow uh, a quick question uh regarding uh you mentioned you're gonna add um like the question the practicing stuff uh you're gonna add like a file or something including this uh sorry i've not, I've not heard the question Oh, like um, for the exercises, you said you're going to uh, follow up with a file, have like the answers or like, I mean, the codes for these. So uh, we can refer back to it later on. Yeah. Uh, so I, I did I did put a, a correction in the in the Google Drive directory. We should see it. Oh, uh, think, OK. So it's different from the box one because the box one doesn't have anything other than uh, just the video. And I think might be one like, slide. Uh, the the books one. I'm not I'm not sure I follow. Yeah, usually uh, Eloy like send us the record, like he uploaded it on uh, like books file. So I I thought like everything. Oh, be... books. Uh, okay. Uh, um. So normally right. the recording should be available for yesterday. Oh and yes, it's there. The, yeah. In the in the Google Drive. Uh, I've also put uh, like a PDF with the solutions for exercise one, two, and three. 
Okay, sound good. Thank you. I just have a question. Could you send the box file link? Because I didn't get an email about it. Like okay, I actually don't have that that one. Uh, I've also asked Eloy for it. Uh, maybe I, I'm, I guess I have it now. Maybe you should email Eloy. Uh, you need invitation, so he have to send that. Yeah, you need okay. to email Eloy Lopez, and and right, he can send you. you the link. Yeah, I have the, yeah, I can't invite you. <laughs> 